can, if you see an elevation like this, I'm not able to s use the cursor here, but you can see the central circular, if you, you, you don't want to do that, the premium lenses particularly, because that would produce and confound the aberrations already done that. And the formula that I said, if AS CRS on calculator is the one I recommend, and also APA CRS, where uh, we'll get uh, much more information. These are the formulas. They will give minimal and maximum. And, and then I recommend to choose a slightly myopic target. We prefer Barrett through K with a specific formula, not the Barrett universal or other one, you know. This is mainly for or only for post-refractive patients. And, and uh, we find it very useful. Uh, not only that, we, we did a study which we are reporting on this meeting and also some others international that we compare all these formulas uh, with Barrett true K formula and that Barrett is Barrett true K and you will see that 90% of the patients fell 0.5 or less as you can see in second column on the right. How do I use the cursor here? Cursor? Use the mouse? I'm moving it but nothing happens. All right, okay. I need a pad here. So, th so we find that Barrett true K is good, but it is surgery that as a surgeon we are all interested. Remember, many of these patients have a compliant globe. I mean, the rigidity of the sclera is uh, very collapsible. And, and uh, you also need to understand where are you going to locate your incision because many of these will gape. The collapsible nature would, uh, would uh, warrant the parameters and the our case in particular you need to make sure you avoid the incision if you can but we have some patients where there is no way you can so that's okay but but moment you make a one entry inflate the eye with soft shell technique or cohesive because you don't want it the the diaphragm to move forward do not make the main incision first because these are really collapsible globe inflate the eye and then then make another can you move more on? Because I can't see the cursor here. Can you move the next slide, please? Next video. I, if you could give me a pad, I can use the cursor. There is no cursor coming up here. Right. And same thing, you need to be scleral or more limbal. And, and these are the eyes where you will need to to address that at the end. Look at the multiple incisions that they have. So I think that's one. And, that's and then performing rexes. In myopic eyes, if you think you're creating five millimeter rexes, you will end up in 5.5 or so because of the magnification and the depth you have. So try to do, aim a little smaller rexes than you would do and you will end up actually in doing the same size at the end. So that, that's the exercise. And then you need to hydro dissect it. Can you move to the next one, please? Sorry. Uh, for the, the compliant nature and the pupil and all these syndromes which have been described, fluid collecting behind the iris and through the zonules, you need to go a low bottle height. And notice the, the bottle height is about 27 centimeter, which is 20 millimeter of IOP, and using a low flow rate of 16 or 18 cc per minute, and use the energy appropriately, but use minimal vacuum. And you can do that very well. If you have already a lens sex or, or a, or a FAMT flex procedure performed, it, we prefer that. And it's amazing that even with the RK incision, many, many times, or most of the time, you can produce a good division and a good rexis of your desired size. And that makes our life easy, but, but the bottle height is very important, as low as you can, but as enough to, to negate uh, the surge and the stability of the eye. So that, that something is very special to this compliant globe and until the end you can continue doing that. Then using bimanual approach you will help to maintain the contours of the globe and there are various techniques of removing cortex. What we recommend is the POPs technique 
which means positioning the aspiration port underneath the capsule, occlude the cortex a little bit, displace that aspiration port slightly posteriorly away from the epithelial cell attachment, and then swipe, stripe, and then do that, rather than tangentially pulling, because uh, Alan Crandall and Liliana Werner showed, and we, we, we also reported that if you do radial pull in these fragile eyes, you can produce the stress on the zonules. So every little step becomes very important. And same thing here, a controlled delivery. And uh, there are various techniques of using the, the preloaded, the manual, the, the automated, auto -serve, whatever. Use a very controlled delivery and make sure that you hydrate these incisions uh, well uh, before, uh, before you before you do that. that the removing the viscoelastic is always putting the irrigation in the posture chamber. And notice here uh, that I am actually, I am keeping the irrigation inflated so the chamber is maintained and while hydrating the incision. Do not take the instrument out just like that because otherwise it will collapse. So maintaining the chamber at every point of time is the key. And these are the results typically. Remember, be prepared to take the sutures if you have to. And uh, that's it, I think. So next one. So finally, I think uh, from surgical standpoint of view, plan it well, good strategy, a good technique in general, but particularly locate the incision, be prepared to look at the end of the surgery and, and address that. Always and always slow motion technique with Dr. Osher and many others have uh, propagated. That means not only the flow rate and vacuum, but the bottle height also. So thank you so very much for patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Abhay. Uh, very nice practical tips on how to uh, really operate uh, post-RK patients, which really gives us a lot of challenges because the incisions are so many. Sometimes optic is not very clear. The limbus is also distorted. Lot, lot many things. And uh, he picked up a nice points for us. And uh, it was real good teaching from us. Now we'd like to invite our guest speaker of today, uh, Dr. Kath, uh, Kathleen uh, McKeby. And she's going to talk about uh, something new, uh, moving the optic to the buzzer space. Let's, uh, we all like to hear this, ma'am, and uh, most welcome. Please. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure and honor to present this on behalf of Lisa Arbisser, who was unable to attend this meeting. These are her disclosures, but we're going to move right on. And there is a blood aqueous barrier breakdown in healing response that results in PCO. What happens is the lens epithelial cells are induced to proliferate, which causes Elschnig pearls, as you can see here, and they're induced to transform either into fibroblasts or myofibroblasts. Fibroblasts causing anterior capsular phimosis and rigidity, wrinkles and contraction caused by the myofibroblasts. So we've done a lot of different things in, over time to try to prevent lens epithelial proliferation, including truncated optic edges, overlapping the anterior capsularexis on the optic, having sharp optic haptic junctions, a sandwich effect of sticky anterior lens epithelial cells, capsular tension rings, and filling the capsular bag, but uh, even in routine cases, doing anterior vitrectomy. But this often fails, up to 38.5% in a meta-analysis, and that is maybe unacceptable and unnecessary, as you'll come to see. So here are some of the changes we typically see. Um, but they have negative and deleterious effects. And if you, you look at this, they can cause some decreased contrast sensitivity with the anterior fibrosis. And even doing a YAG laser capsulotomy is not benign and can cause floaters. And Paul Singh has shown that that can cause some serious decline in visual acuity. So second line defense is removing the scaffolding and planning a posterior primary capsulotomy. This can also cause opacification much more commonly in pediatric cases. So these are reasons to master the primary posterior capsulotomy to reduce PCO. Sometimes you need to do it, as we've seen in many of the talks, talks today and yesterday, because there's an accidental tear in the posterior capsule and you need it to stabilize for bag implantation. You might need immediate visual rehabilitation with an unpolishable plaque, or maybe the patient needs general anesthesia and is unable to get to a YAG yeah, capsulotomy. Uh, there also might be subluxation of the lens, and that would be another way of improving uh, central um, stability. So this is a case where there was a posterior rent and then it is converted into a primary posterior capsulotomy. 
And we're going to move through this a little bit quicker so we can get through. So you'll see here taking care, making a complete posterior capsulotomy. Doesn't really matter what size it is if the intent is to put the IOL into the posterior capsule. And then this can allow for good centralization of the lens. Oh. So yeah, if you want to help me bring that back up. That was a mistake to click on that. It's just my talk. This was actually not the correct uh, talk either, but it's a longer version, so I'm going to run through it a little bit quicker. We'll get there. So there we were with our unplanned. Here's another one where a patient had a dense posterior plaque. And as we move along in this video, we'll see that a primary posterior capsulotomy is another way of helping to improve the visual access immediately. So again, another use for a primary posterior capsulotomy. And we're going to move on from there. So we know that there is an anatomical space to actually put the optic. It's burger space. And it has been demonstrated on different uh, methods that there is actually a physiologic space where the IOL can live. You can even see that on slit lamp at times, although maybe our lights are too bright right here to be able to visualize that well on this slide. In pediatric cases, we often want to do a primary posterior capsulotomy as well in order to prevent the need for a YAG capsulotomy in the future. We're going to move on from this one as well. And this is very interesting. This is uh, courtesy of Dr. Tazignon, Marie Jose. And you can see that if you can see that well on the right hand side, there's intraoperative OCT. And we're going to see what happens when you do a primary posterior capsulotomy. She'll introduce a 30 gauge needle, bevel up. You can watch as that pierces the posterior capsule and still stays away from the anterior hyloid which after that you can see is, and hopefully you can see this, is actually prolapsing through that defect. A little bubble prolapsing there just gently. But if you go in with a cohesive viscoelastic, you can push that back and create a nice space that allows for a safe continuation of that posterior capsulorexis. And what we've seen is that with that technique, you have a very clear visual access. And in fact, Menopache has done a study on compiling over 2,000 patients with no increase in CME, no increase in IOP, only one vitreous prolapse, which was in the first 150 cases, and no increase in retinal detachment. And again, Dr. Tassignon has, has uh, promoted this lens in the bag versus bag in the lens. Actually, her technique is bag in the lens. And there's a really good reason why these ha patients have longer term excellent visual acuity, because you have sequestration of the lens epithelial cells in the periphery, as you can see in the bottom illustration here. And over time, if you look at PCO rates and lens epithelial proliferation, you'll see that bag in the lens, which is the upper line, has absolutely no uh, lens proliferation. There is no place for it to go. It's sequestered in the periphery, whereas there is increasing PCO over months with a uh, lens in the bag. So again, if you look at the data, really there's a large number of big big series of patients at this time, 0% posterior capsulotomy closure rate. And this is what those lens epithelial cells look like in the periphery. And when you have the bag in the lens uh, formation, there are just no lens epithelial cells posteriorly. And they look beautiful in the visual axis. But neither of these techniques is ideal, either a primary posterior buttonhole or, or a bag in the lens technology, because both of these rely on good zonular support. And over time, you can have decentration and subluxation of the bag and the lens. And there's really no possibility for accommodation in these cases. So what these uh, late bag lens subluxations all have in common is an anterior capsulorexis. That's how the lens got in there, right? They often have pseudo-exfoliation. This often happens late, in 8 to 10 years after cataract surgery. It's not prevented by a CTR. And in, at least in the US, and in my experience as well, it's becoming an epidemic. 
And so one way of trying to avoid this is to put the haptics in the sulcus and capture the IOL either in one capsular excess or even better through two, and we're going to talk about that. So here are all the late complications that can happen. And this is another patient with a paintball injury where they had a rupture of the posterior capsule and the IOL was able to be subluxed through that into burger space with good stability overall. And I'm just going to show you what that looks like at the very end. So really nice centration, nice open and clear visual axis that lasts for the lifetime of the patient. So it's cases like this that help us to know that this is a good idea. So moving on. So what we're going to introduce today is this sulcus bicapsulotomy capture as a routine procedure. The critical steps are you have to have an anterior capsulotomy that's about five millimeters in size. You need to remove, obviously, the, the lens from the bag. You can vacuum or polish the capsule. The posterior capsulotomy should be the same size or only slightly smaller, and the goal is to keep an intact hyaloid and a two-compartment eye still as a result of that. The sulcus implantation is of a three-piece IOL, and then the optic is captured through both the anterior and posterior capsulotomies into burger space, and this is kind of what it looks like if you were to see a diagram. The haptics, rather than being in the bag with the optic in burger space, the haptics are in the sulcus, and the optic is in burger space through both. So this is actually a patient of mine, and hopefully it'll play. So this was one of the first cases of this sulcus-based bicapsular support that I did. It's not a difficult technique to learn. This is the implantation portion of it, and in this case, I'm implanting a three-piece silicone lens, a BNL LI 61AO lens, and I'm going to slowly insinuate the two edges of the optic, first behind the anterior capsulotomy, and then secondly behind the posterior capsulotomy. This happens pretty easily. It's a little bit more difficult to get it through the posterior capsulotomy once the haptics are anterior, but not terribly, as you can see, and this really was just one of the first cases. And what you need to do is sort of walk that posterior capsulotomy around the edge, and what you end up with is a nice cat's eye appearance of the capsular bags, confirming that you're through both of the capsulotomies, and there that is. And in this case, as an early case, it is a little bit small on the posterior capsulotomy side. Dr. Oding from uh, Iowa also was able to do a case, and this was really, he heard Dr. Arbrister talk about this technique. This is a case of a patient with JRA who was going to be very difficult to bring back to have subsequent procedures done. And with this, he was able to get a very good result, nice, clear visual access for life. But the problem is, this isn't the easiest technique, and so what are some of the things that we can do to make it more accessible to everybody? And there are some procedures being developed, such as femtosecond laser over primary posterior capsulotomy. And Burkhardt Dick has done some work on this. He says that 72% of adults have a burger space that's visualized, and therefore the hyaloid can be spared. The technique is actually to put OVD behind the IOL, make sure all of the incisions are watertight, redock the patient uh, in the femtosecond laser. In this case, it will be a catalyst. And perform the uh, steps fooling the laser into thinking that the posterior capsule is actually the anterior capsule. And it happens very, very smoothly. And I'm going to get to the back of this so that you can see how that happens since we're out of time. So here's what happens. All the edges of that posterior capsulotomy roll up, and then it moves away and really doesn't become a problem. Somehow that does move out of the visual axis. And let me move to the next slide here. And Dr. Vazavada, this is your uh, LensX experience with the similar thing, doing a primary posterior capsulotomy with the LensX, and in the same uh, Man manner, there is this sort of contraction of the posterior capsule, and it moves out of the visual axis, which I think that's really uh, fascinating that it can happen that way. So there are some economic barriers. Femtosecond laser is expensive. It costs per case for the interface. They're not generally available in the OR where things can be done sterilely, and perhaps this is something that will, will be available in centers of excellence, especially for pediatric cases. The Zepto capsulotomy system was just actually approved in June of 2017 by the FDA, and this is an idea of what might facilitate uh, accessibility to everybody. You can see that the device works by creating multiple 
uh, energy discharges that can cleave the capsule very precisely. It's a very strong technology and about five times stronger than doing a manual capsulorexis, which is on the top, and you can see that that breaks uh, about five times less uh, strength than it takes to break the Zepto capsulotomy. So I think that's a very interesting thing. Um, Dr. Arbisser has done some lab work looking at that. Here's another idea, the capsule laser, which is a thermal pulse laser, uh, which in the lab has been used to do a primary posterior capsulotomy. You can see how easy that was. The capsule does have to be stained in order for this laser technology to work, but that may be another way of making it more accessible to just about everybody. So again, there are, there's a learning curve, manual versus femtosecond, zepto versus capsule laser versus another technology that's being developed, the aperture CTC. Lens exchange, if needed, that would be a difficult thing with pars planar vitrectomy necessary. Maybe a light adjusted lens or perfect lens in the future will help us not to need to do that. It will save millions in YAGs. There is zero visual opacity, pacification. It may eliminate lens bag subluxations. It will permit toric lens use, decreases dysphotopsia. They're acquired or eyes postoperatively, and it may decrease consecutive open angle glaucoma in pediatric patients. And just to wrap it up, uh, with SBCC, you do have an intact hyloid, stable vitreous, reduced risk of RD. There is space for a secondary piggyback IOL should it be necessary. There's improved visual axis clarity, and that Sommering ring is defined to the, or confined to the equator. Maybe there'll be accommodative movement that's still maintained. And thank you to all these people who contributed to this presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kat, Kat, uh, Kathleen. Uh, it was very nice presentation, something uh, new to uh, see. And just one or two questions, uh, if audience has. Abhay, what's your comment on a uh, capture? Because you are a capture man. I think, uh, thank you so very much for wonderful, wonderful videos and uh, crystallizing of thoughts on this. I believe capture is the way to go in many situations, including what you described. And uh, I'm also part of these uh, faculty which you kept mentioning there in various platforms. I recommend you to do capture because in children, you will be able to avoid vitrectomy. Amazing, and we published that uh, very recently. Okay. But not only that, in traumatic cataracts, in anywhere, PCR and wherever, if you capture, you don't need to do vitrectomy. You know, so I, I think, please start learning capture, and we have a video, those are interested, we'll send you that. Uh, capture stuff, which Shail and others have made it, but capture is the way. Thank you for Thank bringing you, that up. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kathleen, uh, anything about IOL power calculation in these pa pa patients because you're making capture and you're going towards the, you know? Uh, uh, actually, space. we didn't do any adjustment over what would be in the bag calculations for these cases. It was the same. Anything different that you do, Dr. Basavada? Yeah, same. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, one more question. If you have a posterior uh, if you have a posterior, like uh, a hyaloid antisurface uh, disturbance, in that case, if you do a posterior capture, like CME and DME, everything will, you know, is possibility. So what kind of precautions you will take not to disturb the anterior vitreous face, anterior hyaloid face, and well, if it happens? So, so that is the trick, obviously, is trying to do that. And if you can have intraoperative OCT that helps you to define where that burger space is, that's a big help. Um, but clearly, there are times where you will inadvertently uh, enter that uh, interhyloid. And in that case, you have to be prepared to do a vitrectomy. And then we do actually use intraoperative steroids to help decrease the risk of CME and other complications. But once you get good at doing the technique, it's actually very easy and safe to do without rupture. Uh, would you avoid doing uh, uh, this rexis and capture in a, a diabetic patient who already has diabetic retinopathy or maculopathy? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, you want to avoid rupturing the anterior hyloid. So if you think that there's a risk that you're not going to be able to do that successfully, that's another thought that you have to make in, in decision making for these high risk cases. whatever you want to do with posterior capsule, as long as, as you say, do not disrupt or puncture anterior vitreous phase, because we talk about PVDs and posterior vitreous, not enough 
knowledge we have about the consequences and function and physiology of antibiotics face. And Mari Jose group are, are the leaders in that uh, uh, area. Thank you, Avay, and thank you, ma'am. Uh, very nice presentation. We are going to the second phase of our instruction course that is uh, talking something on our cutting edge techniques for our some more challenging uh, situations. I already have, along with me, my co-chairpersons, uh, Dr. Rohit, uh, Rohit Omprakash from Amritsar and Dr. Bharti from New Delhi. And we're going to take you through the next set of challenges. I would uh, like to invite Dr. Ramamurthy. He'll be uh, taking us through the another challenging situation. Uh, uh, achieving perfect manual capsular access. I think uh, he has uh, some new techniques and that will be really good for all of us. Uh, Dr. Ramamurthy, please. Thank you. I think quite a challenge to deal with uh, all this in seven minutes, but I'll do my best. So this is the way I do my can manual capsular access routinely. Uh, make a mark on the corneal surface about five millimeters, no staining because of a 14% magnification that's inherent into the anterior chamber optics. It corresponds to a 5.5 millimeters on the surface of the lens. And I always, most of my surgeries are done under topical anesthesia. Stabilize the eyeball with the Sinsky hook uh, gone through one of the side ports go through the other uh, with a bent 26 gauge needle and this mark over there I uh, keep my the confines of the uh, capsular axis within this mark the 30 seconds or so it takes it uh, is quite sufficient and uh, that's the kind of capsular axis repeatedly I'm able to get and that uh, for a six millimeter optic intraocular lens that gives a good overlap and uh, I think uh, uh, I would uh, shift on shift gears and go on to uh, what I do with the femtosecond lasers. Uh, here, basically, this is, I'm first going to be showing a, a routine case of a femtosecond laser. You can see that capsular excess coming on because of the contour guided capsulotomy that's inherent in this. Most often you get a free floating capsular excess like this. And all you need to do is to, once you go in with the FACO probe, it just seems to float in. That's not always the situation. Let's look at some variations. Uh, more often it's on the surface and in which case I, you do what's called the down up technique where I just go up in the utrata forceps and pick up the capsule and then you can see that perfect rexis, well centered rexis. Even in the earlier presentation I showed the ability to perform a rexis even when you have a um, subluxated lens. And in this, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, capsular additions may not be completely free. In a situation like this where you see there are bubbles over here, this is adherent. In case I go in with a down-up uh, technique and pull it up with the forceps, there could be a rexis run off to the periphery. So always before doing that, you have to have a close look at this. And even though everything seems to have gone off quite well, these additions are quite dangerous and you have to go in with a force with a needle and ensure that this uh, capsular axis is completely separated. Maybe this is a slightly more fibrous capsule and this will become more obvious as to what exactly I am doing here. And though a uh, femtosecond laser has been applied and uh, you can see the template of a capsular axis that has been made, it is extremely important that you do not pull on this axis. So I go in with a, a bent 26 gate needle and gather up the capsule in the center. Essentially the maneuvers you do are exactly similar to what you would uh, for your uh, regular capsular axis. You might ask then what is the great advantage? The thing is you have a perfect template which has been created using the platform and it is only the micro additions that are there that are not released and you have to combine uh, what you have been doing for uh, years with uh, the advantage that the femtosecond platform gives. Those are areas of stronger additions which I am freeing up and it is always possible to uh, remove the capsule in one go. Uh, I think the greatest uh, application of the femtosecond platform per se is in um, capsular excess and it is essentially for these intumescent white cataracts like what you see over here where you are able to get a repeatable capsular excess and you can see a free floating excess. I stain these ca capsules because just to make out where exactly the capsule is, you can see that uh, it's just free floating and uh, as I enter with the FACO probe, I'm able to get this rexis out. And uh, it, uh, it's not always that in spite of this half a million dollar platform, you get a situation like this. You can see this uh, intumescent cataract again. This is an even faster platform. It creates the rexis in one second. And I thought I'll see something like what I saw earlier, 
but what you see is a totally disrupted capsule. Of course, this happens rarely, but can occur because of the sudden surge of fluid, the interlenticular fluid flowing out, and you can have a rexus runoff like this, and subsequently the intraocular lens, because the other eye had a multifocal lens, and I had enough um, uh, rexus overlap, I'm going ahead and implanting that. Then what about a situation like this, anterior capsule of fibrosis? We all know that it's uh, quite a challenge to create a rexus. In these cases, I just surround the area of fibrosis. And uh, again, I'm aware of the fact it may not be free-floating. You can see the single area of attachment over here. And uh, it's a little difficult to move this mouse. And over here. And uh, I do go in again with a needle to free up that uh, area of uh, attachment. And you can see this... Uh, uh, central fibrosis and I've been able to circumvent that entirely and create a rexis of my choice of the right size and place the intraocular lens. And of course a more difficult situation like this where you can have a fairly large fibrotic band like this and obviously this is going to be much more challenging and the laser does not cut through this. Essentially you can see, create, see the template that has been created but uh, this is not amenable even if I was to uh, proceed with the 26 gauge needle there could have been an excess runoff so though it looks uh, inelegant what I do is to go in with a uh, one of scissors because I was going to do it through the uh, central incision otherwise you can also use a micro excess scissors and this strong area of addition is essentially cut off with that and then subsequently the excess is removed in total. So essentially you have to understand even though you might have the best of technology in your hands, the combination of uh, using these different techniques so that each case you are able to address optimally is extremely important. Though there is a uh, patch of uh, fibrotic capsule that's left behind, I'm able to, that's the end of, uh, before the lens is implanted and that's what you see at uh, the end of one week. Very strong fibrotic capsule but I've been able to uh, implant the lens in the back. What about in a post-RK situation, laser is light and in, uh, um, in RK incision, laser light may not pass through. This is the first time of a patient, so even though everything went off well, and when you have this frag pattern, sometimes you are not able to visualize the margins of the rexis. So I go ahead and gather up the rexis in the center and remove it. And everything went off very well and it was an 8 incision RK. And the second I done a week later, I was very confident that I had a free rexis. So uh, I went ahead and used the down up technique. And please watch over here. When uh, I did not even realize that there would be a problem, just uh, mobilized the nucleus, removed it. But exactly over here, corresponding to the area of the uh, RK incision, there's a rexis runoff, there's a runoff to the periphery. Fortunately, it did not wrap around, so I could implant the lens in the back. Suffice it to say that whenever you are faced with a corneal opacity situation, you have to be somewhat careful. And uh, uh, in a post-ICL situation, not that you need this instrument to go ahead and do this, this is just to show you that even in these situations it might work. Essentially, it's important that uh, you have to adjust the offsets in such a manner that uh, you compensate for the optics of the ICL. Uh, I have seen a video from Chandra Bala where we bisects the entire intraocular lens before removing it. It just shows you the energy levels that you can achieve with uh, the femtosecond laser. This is with the ICL in place, the rexis has been created. Um, most, uh, and uh, that's the in, uh, lens which has been removed. Obviously, it's not a free-floating rexis, but again, as you can see, it's a very nice template that has been created, and uh, I'm able to just gather up the rexis in the center, and a uh, well-centered rexis. So obviously it's doable to remove the, expand the rexis, the uh, intraocular lens and then remove the rexis. But this just allow, shows you the accuracy with which you are able to control your procedures. Uh, thank you so much for your kind attention. Yeah. Next is uh, Dr. Abhay Vasavada. He would be speaking on uh, posterior polar cataracts. Uh, I do receive a finance research support grant from Alcon, but uh, has uh, nothing to do with these presentations. And I'm going to share some polls that I have gathered from the experts around the globe, and some of them are already sitting here on the dais and in the hall. First thing is, you must understand, avoid rapid buildup of hydraulic pressure. It is the hydraulic pressure which ruptures the capsule, remember. So, Anything which can potentially produce hydraulic pressure, like, like subcapsular hydrodissection, you don't want to do it, which has become a rut in our thing. 
And even if you want to do it at any stage, do it gently and slowly and not rapidly. Second pearl I would suggest is to create a protective cushion effect of the lens material and keep that cushion effect as long as you can uh, uh, while you're removing the central nucleus. And we, with our team, introduced a concept of producing hydrodelineation, uh, unlike the conventional hydrodice uh, delineation, where there is a possibility sometimes, not in your hand, but sometimes, can go in subcapsular manner and, and uh, produce uh, inadvertent hydrorapture, as you saw that. Now, it is in, can you go back? Go back, please. Uh, instead, if you create a trench and then produce a, a defect, I think we are okay, Shail, that's okay. Uh, this is what the inside out means. You go in the core of the nucleus and then produce a delineation so the chance of going inadvertently into the subcapsular zones are minimized. And you can titrate the depth of the nucleus material by introducing that cannula, as I'm showing you here. You can, in the wall, you can go superficial, you can go deep, depending upon the density of the nucleus, and you will produce a hydrodelineation. This is a typical posterior polar cataract, uh, so that it's very soft. Uh, you can do it on each side. Third principle, uh, after creating cushion and avoiding rapid buildup, third one is to avoid the forward bulge. And we discussed that in a previous session. Adhere to the principles of closed chamber technique, and there are many pearls. One of them is uh, inject OVD prior to exiting it. And I learned from Dr. Osher uh, before some of you were born. Uh, very, very important step avoiding. And therefore, when you make an incision, entry into the eye also, make a small port entry, OVD, and then and then make a main port so that there is no forward ball. And once again, by manual vitrectomy, if you have to, by manual irrigation aspiration, as I alluded to that, the technique we call POPs, positioning the aspiration port under the anti-capsule P, occluding the cortex, and displacing it a little bit more posteriorly, and then swipe. Uh, is something we find useful, but you do whatever, that's not an issue. By man. The fourth pearl is a communication between the anterior and posterior compartment within the bag. Once you remove the nucleus, now you have an happy nucleus. So before you get excited to do whatever, make sure that the, the space in front of the happy nucleus, anterior compartment, and the space the critical space between the post epinucleus and posterior capsule, these two compartments, you have a communication. So there is no chance or little chance of building hydraulic pressure. And that's what we do. Remove the away part of the epinucleus, nasal part, and establish a communication. The fluid now is entering from anterior to posterior, posterior to anterior, so there is no rapid buildup. There is a lot of space, and then you can do subcapsular hydrolyzed section or whatever you want to do it. So that, that thing, creating a communication. And, and femtodelineation, delineation, we love it. And, and uh, that's because uh, uh, it really gives you a controlled uh, layers. And Dr. Samresh taught us on this clay model how it works. And, and, and you can see that if you produce this uh, cushion effect, when you remove the one, the other layers act as a cushion effect until you really come to the very last stage of epinucleus. So we find femtodelineation uh, even more controlled than inside-out deletion, which I find is better than a conventional hydrodelineation. So I think as we progress, you decide uh, whatever you want to do, but create cushion. And uh, Dr. Titial mentioned that in his presentation earlier in this first part of the course very elegantly. We, we found our rupture rate dropping from 38%. Ours was the highest reported rupture rate in the 90s. And then we produced, uh, we learned, we, we produced inside out and we have at 8% or so, and now our rupture rate has gone down even with this. So this is what, what uh, uh, the progress of all, and thanks to all of these stalwarts which taught us. But this is the surgical video of how that works. When one central cushion is removed, the other one acts as a cushion, and you can take your time, you can shell that into and feed that into the probe, uh, one cushion after another, and then and, and you can continue doing that uh, very, very slowly. Notice the bottle height is low, the floor rate is low, and just sufficient vacuum, not enough, not much. It's, I think it's 100 or 
200 or whatever, but, but go very slowly and you can just finally feed that into the FACO probe. And then once again, inject the viscoelastic before you exit out. And then what you're doing is to do once again the bimanual and that you've seen it earlier. So the beauty is that it, these, uh, these kind of technology assisted thing works even in a denser nucleus as this patient postipolar had, which is not typical, but they can have a nuclear cataract. And this is one it had. And you, it, you can do the same thing. If it is very dense, you can combine the circles and the chop pattern both. And it's amazing uh, that you can create a cushion effect until the very end. Once again, bimanual uh, irrigation aspiration, and then you are able to preserve the integrity of the posterior capsule, putting the lens in the eye. Uh, I find hydrophobic eye well good because it opens up slowly, uh, and I'm also used to that. And, uh, but you can do whatever. I suggest that whatever you use, use cohesive viscoelastic in the bag so that uh, the, the unfolding will not uh, damage the posterior capsule. And Pearl 6 always preoperatively counsel this patient the possibility of two procedure, either at the same time or, or two different times. I used to counsel it two different times, but now that we have this team, we do it at the same time and, and do that. So that's very important. And also, if you promise toric or something, you need to give them an option. But this is very important. Posture polar is not un un over until you remove the spaculum. And this is the case which would illustrate. I'm so happy my, my assistants are, are describing and they're packing the material from the trolley and this is what I did. I just hydrated and I ruptured the posture capsule. And if you read, and, and this is how it uh, went, this is how it looked at the end. Uh, luckily, uh, the, the eye looked good uh, down the line. So finally, these are my pearls. Uh, counseling is number one, in my opinion. Always counsel the patient and anticipate, prepare your team for every possible eventuality. All the backup lenses of all kinds, if you have a multifocal toric, in the fellow eye, it doesn't matter what the fellow eye is. I heard sometime in the morning that if the fellow eye is this, I want to do second eye this. No. See that eye safety first and the quality. I had two cases where I, and it always happens in the multifocal or toric. Fellow eye rupture, the NRI uh, Gujarati patient came from America to get operated. First eye did well, comes back again. Second eye rupture. I had to tell her on the table. I will not be able to do this, it's good, and you will have to a reading aid and whatever, but make it safe. So thank you so very much. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Abe, uh, how about the sizing and the shaping of the capsular axis, oval axis, and yeah, would you like I to think I'm so happy that you brought uh, a yeah. wonderful concept by my friend up in his town, Dr. Uh, Kiran, Kiran Jit Singh, Jit Singh yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, son of late, great, great Daljit Singh. Yeah. And he is advocating, he has published that, and he's asking me to talk to Alcon that if I <laughs> yeah. can have a uh, software where he can produce and change the shape of the rectus, and I think it is a great idea. I don't do that, yeah. but I, I understand the concept, and I think this is one of the ways which you help to remove the sub incisional and not awkward. I have been and using and it uh, for the last uh, two years. You are years. doing that? Yeah, two years, and it, I call it two in one uh, capsular axis. It takes the advantages of all the uh, larger axes, does away with the negative points, and the small axes also, you know, so it's a two. I think it's, it's a great concept. I wish I could do that like you. Second thing is the size. Whatever the size, you need to be, keep the capture, which Arup showed in the morning, those who have not missed it, which you rupture, he showed very well how you can fixate and stabilize the IOL. Remember that video? Put this IOL in the ciliary sulcus and capture. For capture, if most of the six millimeter optic would need 4.5, 4.6, or seven, but not five because it will come out. So smallish rexes than you would normally do. You can always enlarge if you want to, but that, that's fine. So thank yeah, you for another, another point yeah, because there are so many yes. of us who are sitting. Uh, have you tried bi-incisional uh, phaco emulsification? You buy uh, the two, two bi-incisional. Bi uh, oh, what Herschel Tuck has been talking about in uh, patients. What do you mean by the separate irrigation? Yeah, I'll, I'll just let. 
in bi incisional what he does it and those patients who have grade 2 or grade 3 where you don't want to rotate the nucleus oh. so he does emulsification of the nucleus from one side the 6 o'clock 5 o'clock 7 o'clock relative to the main incision and if he finds that he would not like to rotate he makes another incision 90 degree apart and that way he's able to take out all the nuclear pieces so that also makes sense in you know uh, <laughs> well, it certainly makes sense to Herschel Tan, that for sure. But I have also... But, but I really... Uh, you are doing it? Yeah, I tried it in grade 3 once, uh -huh. and I found that it did work. Well, I, I, it is amazing how skillful surgeon can do whatever he wants to. Can I just so add that's a comment what, That proves the point. Yeah. Can I, just uh, I would be cautious and I would not consider that, but that's a different matter. Yeah. It's about 15 or 20 years back, uh, Dr. Sundaramurthy from Coimbatore had presented exactly the same thing. Two different incisions for heart postipolar cataracts. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but actually, to now is, I must acknowledge the surgeons in Punjab. I was uh, invited for the oration, first oration on the Daljit Singh's medal, and I saw one presentation, I can't remember his name, not from Amritsar, but some other town. He showed this FACO probe going so awkwardly, and I was saying, why are you making your life awkward? And I had discussed in the coffee time, and he said, this is what I do. So it's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. We now move ahead to Dr. Bharti, as Bharti from Delhi who would be speaking about what an ideal IOL should be. Over to Dr. Bharti. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rohit, uh, and thanks uh, uh, the scientific committee for giving me this opportunity. I'll be talking about what an ideal IOL should be, and uh, what are the options available. The options are like holder, folder, uh, the manual loading with push or screw type and preloaded lenses. And here I'll be talking about the new lenses which have come into the picture especially the new NIDAC lens, which is I'm using, used more nearly 1,000 lenses with amazing results. Factors to be considered is, first is the small incision size, and small incisions are part of overall visual acuity because the surgeon-induced astigmatism is smaller with smaller incisions. So 1.8 or probably smaller than that will be absolutely wonderful and will create least amount of astigmatism, creating a, you know, a possibility of uh, wonderful uh, visual results. Now, IOL injection, corneal wound, IOL injection has the greatest effect on, inc on incision stability because cornea's capacity to, for stretching or elastic is, uh, you know, deformation is limited and as the cornea stretches, there's more damage to the architecture causing more and more incision integrity is, you know, um, uh, damaged. So variables affecting wound enlargement are closed versus wound assisted injectable IOLs, the speed of insertion, the IOL power and cartridge size and design. And as we all understand when the, cart the, the, the IOL power is higher there is more damage to the cartridge uh, snout as well as the you know incision site. So that is another factor that even with this largest of you know power which you want to insert the, ins the lens should be able to fold and go through the smallest of incisions. Another important fact is requirement of wound integrity where, you know, a, a, a lens which is the incision which is leaky can cause post-op post potential hypotony thereby increasing the possibility of fluid ingress causing endophthalmitis at a later point in time. So that is again very important that wound integrity should be wonderful even after the lens has been inserted. Post imp implantation incisions, you know, with less associated wound stretch is there with the wound assisted insertion, but also the fold, you know, the, the inserter plastic and the flexibility and smaller in stout which has got an inferior possibility of opening when the lens is passing through is again a wonderful, you know, way not to allow the wound stretch in all these cases. Now, push type versus screw type injector systems, we all know that, you know, the push type are easier, screw type requires a bilateral, bimanual, you know, incision, you know, injecting of the IOLs. So, uh, these push type injectors are much more suitable for, you know, ease of use by the surgeon. A screw type system, they allow a constant insertion speed and uh, avoid resistance force but they require both hands. So in these cases where the screw type systems are there, um, uh, inject, you know, a mechanical system where the, it is automated system is, you know, considered a little better. 
So why do we need a preloaded delivery system? Because I am sure preloaded is better. It, cons it is consistent, predictable and controlled insertion with minimal incision. It, this in eliminates need for post-operative cleaning and sterilization. It is saving time because the lens is already loaded and also eliminating hand eliminates the handling and misloading of the IOL. So that is very important fact when the assistants or the OT staff is doing the you know loading of the IOL in the inserter. Post-op endophthalmitis, endophthalmitis, as I said, they, they, the possibility of endophthalmitis is because they are handled in the OT1 and 2 if the wound is leaking and not very, uh, you know, uh, it can allow the ingress of the fluid. So, injectable IOL is, uh, you know, better and uh, preventing the infections. The impact of a preloaded intraocular lens delivery system or op in, on operating room efficiency in routine cataract surgery is, you know, a fact which is, you know, uh, well known. Using preloaded intraocular lens delivery system compared with manual preloaded oil delivery processes during routine cataract surgeries were studied, and all the sites had preloaded delivery system, decreasing the mean total case time by 12 percent which is a significant when you have a large you know OT list in your cases. So ideal preloaded IOL system should be optimized design for a small incision size, smooth passage of IOL through the device with minimum friction thereby causing no damage to the IOL optics or haptics, smooth folding and unfolding and very cost effective and convenient to use. So these are few factors and uh, uh, also uh, there should be more efficiency, reproducibility and safety. So in all these cases, uh, this, you know, uh, prevents the infection and cross-contamination and oil scratches and all these are available with the NIDAC IOL which I have been using. So I am very happy with these systems and I am sure preloaded sy systems will ultimately become the preferred method of delivery. The refractive outcomes of a cataract surgery today are better than ever because of small incisions, high quality IOL materials, delivery system that act in concert with them. Injectors are a critical piece of procedure and the only product uh, you know, that stays with the patient is the IOL and the delivery system is responsible for getting it there. So all this you know, delivery system has to be very perfect. Thank you very much. Dr. Bharti, you are absolutely right. I have also used thousands of these uh, intraocular lenses from NIDEC and I find that they really make a difference in the surgical uh, setup. I can never. I'm trying to push it in. It will not go because it's just about half in, half out. If it was three-fourth in, it would have possibly gone in with some maneuvers. But if it is half in, half out, best to remove it. Increase the size of the incision a little bit put the nozzle, put the tip of the injector right into the center, under visualization, the leading haptic must go inside the bag, remembering the fact these are weak bags, these are small bags, and the uh, trailing haptic also settles in quite well. So this was something like an obstructed labor in ophthalmology during phaco emulsification. So when such things happen, let ego not come into the way, and let us increase the size of the incision, do whatever maneuver is best for that time. So this is a severe microcornea, 7.5 millimeters only and 7.5 millimeters is really really short you have to get a good rexis and that means that a rexis of this size which would be about 5.5 millimeter is going to be quite large for this eye so here i'm attempting and you can see that i'm putting on the rexis marker and putting in tripan blue as well so you can see that uh, this time I'm attempting this colobomatous eye with an incision that is scleral. I've made a scleral incision Y so that I can maneuver the tip a little better within the eye and uh, I do not end up occluding the uh, amount of uh, the uh, irrigation port in the uh, sleeve or in the uh, main port of the incision. So again, uh, I'm able to get uh, a good and neat rexis through a, through a cystome, but if required, the best is to get it done with a micro forceps, uh, with, uh, which can give a very, very good uh, maneuverability inside. Now, just look at this place where I'm removing, I'm putting in viscoelastic and removing the phaco tip 
all the time and uh, trying to be extremely careful, but I have made a complication. So you can see centrally there's a desmet tear where my phaco tip touched the uh, the cornea, the endothelium, and uh, I go ahead placing viscoelastic, high molecular weight viscoelastic to support that torn desmets, and I'm able to place the whole uh, lens inside the bag. So some pearls for the colobomatocytes, liberal use of viscoelastic, dispersive viscoelastics in the bag, phaco emulsification, being as careful as possible, sealing the incisions well and following up with retinal evaluation because these patients need the care of a retinologist throughout their lives. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Partha. A beautiful demonstration of uh, handling the uh, colobomatous eyes. Uh, we invite uh, Partha V there. We invite Do Dr. Rohit Amprakas, uh, who has a, a rapid technique for soft cataracts. I have two uh, queries. Uh, if you look into all these collaborators' eyes, the pupil is uh, you know, shifted downwards. Yeah. Uh, when we do a surgery, the lens is going to you know, set or rest in the center piece. The optic of the eye will doesn't coincide with the pupil subsequently uh, would have in these cases. Yeah. So would you make some sort of a pupil enlargement towards the end of surgery so that optic eye will comes to the center of the pupil? Uh, second one is, you know, leaving a slightly larger rexus, the inferior part, which is a colobomatous, so that it's subsequently it becomes opaque and uh, blocks the aphecic zone. Yes. So that part, the second question, absolutely, sir, you're right. The amount of uh, anterior capsule that has to be left inferiorly, which opacifies with time, actually gives a lot of advantage to the patient as far as the optical quality of the vision goes. The uh, second thing is uh, uh, the... Um, what? Uh, yeah, so making a larger pupil or a pupil of plastic. So because these eyes have been accustomed for all these years to this amount of vision through a pupil. So I think the neuroadaptation and all these are poorly seeing eyes, not more than three meters or four meters or five meters, and especially if the macula is involved, it does not make too much of sense to you know, enlarge it to give more light within the eye because this is the final vision that the patient is to get. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You, Partha. Thank uh, you, yeah. uh, Dr. Rohit, please. Uh, he has a beautiful technique for soft cataract. I'd like to see his videos. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jeevan. Uh, I thank uh, the organizers for calling me over to speak on this technique of mine, which happens to be the rapid technique for soft cataract conquest. We, we know that there are increasing soft cataract surgery number, and we all are aware of what they are. And basically, it's just that we have problems with them because we are not used to doing soft cataract emulsification. We are only used to divide and conquer, stop and chop, and other techniques. These soft cataracts have difficult. Oh. Can you switch on the video? Yeah. Uh, the separation is difficult because when you try to separate, it ultimately cheese wires through. Uh, through the nucleus piece and when you are trying to hold what happens is that you inadvertently end up in aspirating the nuclear piece. So these are the problems with fragmentation techniques which we employed for highly soft cataracts. So for these purposes what is required is that we use non-fragmentable techniques. The endocapsular carousing technique is one technique which has been in vogue. But as you can see in these cases, the parameters are very high and there's a strong probability of causing collateral damage in an event of occlusion break with a posterior capsule rupture. A sister uh, technique of this is the cartwheeling technique which we are also aware and the high uh, parameters and event of uh, occlusion break can cause also these problems associated with posterior capsule rupture. So these are the techniques which we have to take with uh, a bit of salt. So the technique which I'm going to put across is the RAPID technique which is basically an acronym. The RAPID in the RAPID the R stands for the rotation of the nucleus piece freely. So what you need to do is you need to rotate the nucleus freely and then comes A in the acronym. The A stands for aligning the phaco tip sideways so you align it sideways. Then we come to the next one in that acronym. It's the P. 
P stands for placing the phaco tip at the nuclear rim. Once you place it at the nuclear rim, then you can continue ahead and impale it into the nuclear rim. Impaling into the nuclear rim is followed by the dowering or the emulsification of the nucleus. This is basically the steps which I will go into details by showing different videos as I go along. R. Yeah, R, A, P, I, and D. So this is what it is, the rapid technique. So this, in this, you don't need to have a larger capsular axis. A normal size capsular axis does, a five millimeter or so. As you would see that it's a, a subcapsular cataract. So this technique holds good for subcapsular developmental cataracts or refractive surgery patients who are for capsular. Uh, a hydro dissection has been done. R is the rotation of the nuclear piece, then A comes the alignment, P is the placement, then impaling and then devouring of the, uh, of the nuclear piece. The CD is still zero, so you need, uh, since it is soft, you are still in, you were still in uh, while impaling the nucleus in foot switch two, but at times you may have to shift to foot switch three for a few milliseconds and back to foot switch two. The, this technique has to be followed in those individuals who happen to be in the younger or in the middle age group. Because as and how, the, here you will see the hydro dissection has been done, the nucleus has, is being rotated. So at times it is an exercise to rotate the nucleus, then you can do multiple points hydro dissection. Rotate it, align it, place it, Impaling in the initial stages, you have to, you know, uh, 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 customize your foot switch to such a way that you don't have any issue. So once you are able to do it, it's no issue whatsoever. So this is what it was. I was talking about it being relevant in the bigger age group because in the this is an unedited video. You will find it was the impaling was becoming difficult. Place it, impale it. Yeah. I was having issues with that. So these were the initial cases in which I was doing this rapid technique. Once it, you're, you're able to put it across, then it's not an issue. In, a, in elderly, the nucleus, the <laughs> transparent nucleus is not that soft and the nuclear piece is larger, so it's not possible to bring it out through a, uh, a, through a normal sized capsular axis. So this is a, uh, an individual who happens to be around 28 years old and uh, you would see uh, the capsular axis size is smaller. It's hardly five millimeter. It's maybe 4.5 or 4.8, whatever you may call it. So the uh, CD is 1.37. This is another one. So uh, the amount of uh, energy which is being used as it is synonymous with the soft cataracts in these cases is practically on the lesser side. At times, it is as low as 0 0.10, as you would see. The question which comes in one's mind is that what are the chances of having a, uh, a, a, a chance of having a posterior capsule rupture? Well, it is a multi-planar technique. You will see that CD is still zero. And I'm working at the plane of anterior capsule or at the plane of the iris. So I'm far away from the endothelium and I'm far away from the posterior capsule. I am a, basically a compulsive, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, in this patient, this is not, this is the another, another one, I found that the, uh, it was softer than what I had thought. The age group was around 55, so I did a variation of this technique, just made a valley and then did the, uh, the uh, what do you call this, rapid technique. I am a compulsive uh, uh, chopper and I found that it was too soft for my liking. The age group was 60 or more. When I was trying to sculpt, I found that I was able to sculpt it to a large extent with a small uh, emulsification uh, in foot switch three, and this is the, uh, what do you call, uh, a variation of this uh, technique for older age group, wherein you find it is highly soft for all that matter. This is uh, the last recoup. In other words, what is happening is, uh, it is basically a multi-planar technique. In the multiplanar technique, I am working at the level of iris or at the level of anterior capsule. 
the moment I impale it, I bring it to the level of the interior capsule and then in the safe zone the emulsification is carried on and it is completed. I was initially doing that salute technique but I found it a bit difficult and uh, since the time I have shifted to this technique I have found it a much better and a much reproducible technique once I get through with initial hang-ups. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Rohit. Uh, beautiful videos and uh, the concept is very appropriate for a soft cataract. Sometimes we do have a lot of difficulty managing soft cataracts, especially uh, where you have a uh, poor delineation uh, and one of the crux for a managing soft cataract is a good delineation. And uh, he showed a different technique where you could do a, you know, uh, one stage, the uh, entire thing can be taken away. Very nicely done, uh, yeah. Rohit. Uh, yeah. We invite Dr. Arup. Uh, he is going to take us uh, beyond the malignant ring uh, for a small pupil management in FECO. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, giving me an opportunity to be here. Uh, there are a uh, lot of devices available for uh, managing a small pupil. I have used uh, all of these. The BHEX design, designed by Suven, of course, is a very good uh, uh, device. But in this presentation, I'll be talking to you about two devices, which I use pretty frequently whenever there is an indication. And these are going to be video presentations. Now, uh, this particular case, uh, I'm going to demonstrate the Oasis Iris Expander. Uh, this particular device, as you will see here, This is a single piece uh, block of a square of polypropylene with pocket on each edge of the square. So this particular pocket, it cradles the pupillary margin without crimping it or without damaging it. So it is very tissue friendly. It comes docked in the transparent nest as you see here. And this is one unit, the inserter. The inserter is connected to the inserter, uh, to, the, to the device and there is a uh, thumb uh, uh, device, thumb rest here to manipulate the device, to fold the device into the channel of the inserter. Now uh, this particular case is an elderly man in his 70s, a deep set eye, smallish uh, pupil. So temporal uh, clear corneal uh, cataract surgery using a uh, uh, topical anesthesia. So anterior capsule has been stained with tripan blue dye and uh, soft shell technique has been used to, to, pre to pr prepare the eye for cataract surgery and to receive the device inside the eye. Now, uh, as we go to the device, so now, uh, this, this is uh, the inserter. This is from Oasis. And uh, this inserter is, uh, you know, is attached, is docked to the iris expander, as you see here. Now here, uh, the retractor is, the, the, the handle is pushed, pulled behind. Now I'm not really withdrawing the device into the, into the cannula of the inserter. So it is pre-folded and it is brought to the folding area. So this is the folding area, the rear end of the nest. And then the thumb rest, thumb button is withdrawn so that the ultimate folding of the device takes place and it is withdrawn within the cannula of the inserter. So you are, you are now ready to go into the, into the anterior chamber to manage the small pupil. So uh, uh, again, you know, you require the anterior chamber to be pretty deep in this kind of situation. And we also inject a little bit of OVD under the iris. We don't want to be traumatizing the anterior capsule. So the uh, inserter is kept somewhere at the center of the pupil. The entire device is released into the anterior chamber. Please do not make any attempt to engage the pupillary margin in the first shot. Once that is done, a further OVD is injected. This device has a little bit of vertical profile. So I, I always engage the left proximal pocket, as you see here. There is a positioning hole. So it is very easy to manipulate uh, the entire uh, uh, ring device. So once the left proximal hook, uh, the, the pocket has been engaged, then the opposite one, the right distal one, again I would inject some more OVD into the anterior chamber. There's a little bit of arca senale, so we really don't see the positioning hole. So everything in cataract surgery should be drawn under direct vision as far as possible. So the device is repositioned, slightly retracted, so that you see the positioning hole and then the right proximal, right distal uh, pocket is again engaged into the pupillary margin. During the manipulations, you will see that uh, the pupil becomes, the iris becomes slightly stretched. 
And uh, if you have selected your patients properly, if it is not a very fragile, thin, atrophic iris, uh, nothing goes wrong. You really don't have to worry about, you know, iridodialysis or other kind of iris trauma. So once uh, uh, the prox left proximal and the right distal uh, pockets have been fixed, we uh, look into the other uh, pockets and they're sequentially uh, engaged to the iris. So uh, it is a quite a friendly device in the sense that it doesn't hamper your uh, to and fro movements of the FECO handpiece. It's very easy to insert the FECO handpiece, your left hand instrument, the, the Sinsky hook or the chopper or whatever you use, you're using. And it gives you a, a, quite an adequate uh, sized pupil. It comes in two sizes, 6.25 millimeters and 7 millimeters. I prefer to use the 7 millimeter uh, device for very large, uh, for very hard cataracts. And for routine cataracts, I use the smaller 6.25 millimeter device. So here, what I have done is uh, you, you have to bring the entire device again into the anterior chamber. It is not really difficult. Sometimes the Sinsky hook may get engaged to the positioning hole. Then you can use a bimanual approach with your left hand and then you can disengage it. Uh, so that is what is done. And then there's the, the crossbar here is aligned along the incision. I'm using a reverse Sinsky hook here. You could use a Kuglen hook, even you could use a McPherson forceps to you know, hold the, the crossbar, one of the crossbars, and then pull it out of the eye. So this device does extremely well, and uh, you know, it is affordable. It is pretty, pretty, pretty much available compared to the other ring devices, more popular ones available in the market. Now I move on to the next device, which is the Bivitec BVI eye ring. So this particular device is made up of polyurethane. You know, it, it again is a single piece device. It has a positioning hole and then it has got uh, pockets here and then this living hinges. So this is how it comes. Again, it comes as a single unit with the handle, which is uh, docked inside the transparent rest nest that houses the uh, eye ring. Uh, this comes in only in one size. This is about 6.25 millimeters in size. And uh, handling technique is pretty much the same, but for the initial step. Initially, you see, I would, I would withdraw the, fold the entire device and withdraw it within the cannula of the inserter. Unlike the previous device, the OSS ring, where I pre-fold it so that you know, it stays folded for some time before I withdraw it into the cannula. It goes in through a 2.2 millimeter incision. Again, my strategy is going to be the same. You, know, you, you could perhaps try to engage the distal pocket and, you know, into the, into the, uh, into the pupillary with the pupillary margin, but I don't think really it is really worthwhile. You know, I mean, it, is, it, it could give us the complications. It could struggle. The, the, one of those pockets could go under the pupillary margin, uh, under the iris. So here you just release it in the anterior chamber and use your Sinsky hook and the, 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 the hook, the device uh, comes with, uh, the, with the, you know, ring itself. So first I would engage the distal one here. And uh, again, in the, then I go with the proximal one. A Little bit of iris stretching occurs. And uh, as I said, to, told you earlier, it is not a matter of great concern. I would not be using these devices under a few, con any, any pupillary device I would not be using under three situations. Number one, when the pupil is really small, three millimeters or smaller than that, because a lot of manipulations are involved in getting the devices in, to engage the pupillary margin. Second situation is when the anterior chamber is very shallow. Thir third situation is when the iris is really atrophic, fragile, and you know, it, has, it, it may have a tendency to get to tear you know, during the manipulations. So again, the FECO is done quite uh, comfortably. The entire device is released from the pupillary margin. It is brought into the anterior chamber. And this one uh, can be easily folded back into the, into, into the inserter. So I bring the, the living hinge, the, the hinge that you see here, which is again aligned with the uh, main incision, temporal clear condyle incision, as you will see here. And then the, the uh, inserter is, uh, is inserted in, through the incision. You have to use a little bit of ovary to push the iris behind. And then the prongs, you know, make sure that there is free movement. It's a good idea to prime the cannula with some BSS because otherwise there may be a trapped air bubble that may come in. So you engage the living hinge, hinge between the platform and the prongs and then fold it, the entire thing within, within the cannula of the inserter and then take the whole thing in out of the eye. So it does pretty well. So basically a few advices while using both these devices, you know, so it is, uh, don't try to engage the pupillary margin in the first shot. You release the whole the entire device within the anterior chamber. The Sinsky hook has to be kept vertically. Don't keep it obliquely. Then it, it, you, don't, you don't succeed in engaging the device. 
little bit of stretching of the iris that occurs until unless the pupil is too small is acceptable. And uh, sometimes you know, once the device is engaged with the pupillary margin, it may be eccentric. So it is a good idea to you know, recenter the entire device. Sometimes if it is little elongated, sometimes we have a rectangle shape instead of a circle, you can use two Sinsky hook to stretch the device, both the devices to get, get a round shape. And as I mentioned earlier, you have to prime the inserter with OVD when you're trying to take the device out of the eye so that you have avoid the air bubble problem and slowly withdraw the eye ring to avoid unexpected orientation of the ring. So don't do it very fast. You know, do it go slowly so that the whole thing comes inside the cannula of the inserter and then things go on fine. So basically, uh, there are so many devices available in the market and uh, most of the devices are good. And these two devices which I've been using for the last couple of years have done it pretty well in my hands. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Arup, for uh, showing the devices here. I think, you know, if you have a, a, a floppy uh, pupil uh, where you have, you know, uh, this looks quite bulky, it may not be comfortable in a small rigid pupil, you know. So it may be a good option for a, a floppy pupil where you begin with a, a pupil is slightly larger and you can put uh, comfortably to prevent subsequent uh, problems. Yes, sir. Sir, if it is an eye face candidate with a small pupil where I expect the eye pupil to be very you know, iris to be floppy. I would not use a ring device anyways. I'm going with iris hooks. Because, see, the ring devices will just enlarge the pupil. But the mid-peripheral iris is still floppy. And it, it will still have a tendency to prolapse through the paracentesis incision and main incision. So it is only the iris hooks which uh, solve the problem. Next. Would you like to comment? Uh, uh, yeah. And what is your cutoff uh, for this? When do you put the uh, ring? About 2.5 to 3 millimeters. Less than that, I would use iris hooks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now we move on to Thank Dr. Uh, Tetyal, who would be speaking on uh, some, some of the posterior polar cataracts, tips and tricks to no, enhance. No, I'm to, because Abhay has just covered, I'll take you to some other areas. So I'm going to show you some of the you know, difficult scenarios, especially white cataracts, intumescent cataracts. And now what are the challenges we face in such cases here? So this is a white cataract here. You see here, uh, the challenges here is basically doing a good uh, capsule analysis, which uh, requires uh, staining of the anterior capsule. You can see a nicely stained anterior capsule here. And needle cystitome uh, is a good idea in uh, intumescent cataract because the viscoelastic doesn't come out uh, through the pores. It maintains the uh, pressure onto the anterior capsule. So you can do a nice manipulation uh, in these cases with uh, uh, white cataracts. If you use a main port and uh, using a methyl cellulose sometimes then it can come out and the entire rexus can be difficult in, to manipulate as such. But if you have a nicely uh, uh, taut anterior capsule, you can do a very nice uh, uh, capsule rexus. You can in fact uh, enlarge the capsule rexus by a spiraling technique uh, as such. So that gives you a very nice orientation for a subsequent uh, surgery done. You can see there's a completion of FACO in this patient. Nice rexus has been done and implantation would be uh, nice in such cases. So this is what is required. Sometimes you have a, such a high pressure uh, where you cannot do anything. Uh, this is a patient, young patient with intermission cataract. Uh, can see Dr. Namrata Sharma. You can see a nick you make here and it goes to periphery like an Argentinian flap. So it's very difficult to manage such cases. So there is no option, you may have to do a little uh, uh, incision here to make it a larger opening and subsequently uh, do a emulsification. This is a soft cataract and you can very easily aspirate uh, without uh, causing too much a problem. The idea here is to not to allow this anterior tear to extend to posterior side. So that is very, very important uh, issue. But luckily here uh, we had a pressure which is came down and you could still do a uh, uh, two semilunar uh, uh, capsule axis both anterior and posteriorly and we could complete the FACO in this patient. This is a similar video <coughs> of one of a patient with a raised interlenticular pressure here. You can see a, uh, which is already in a severe pressurized situation here. So once you do a nick here it also has a tendency to go to peripheral areas. So I was thinking what should I do to prevent, uh, because we, I had used a um, heavy uh, viscosity, viscoelastic. I made a nick here and a nick here. So we had a four uh, radial cuts. So this distributed the pressure to uh, four areas and it didn't go to periphery. And in the meantime, the pressure uh, came down and subsequently you can complete this rexis uh, despite having a high pressure. So this is not a complete uh, rexis here. It has to go uh, to the peripheral areas 
uh, till the radial uh, tear is here, it has to go peripherally and come out. So similarly, I'm trying for here to complete here, and this can be done with under a good viscoelastic cover. The idea here is to decrease the pressure by somehow. People use uh, a 26 uh, gauge needle directly go into uh, the cortex and aspirate a little bit, or you can make a little puncture and aspirate. But as we saw in a previous video, we didn't have option, we didn't have time to uh, decrease the pressure. So that should be judged by a proper assessment of these patients. So I'll go beyond the uh, cut area to complete this uh, uh, radial cut, which is there, a subsequent phaco becomes easier in such cases. This is another white cataract where uh, we try the technique of aspiration in such cases. The initial uh, uh, staining the capsule, you can see again an intumescent cataract here making a nick and try to make a small opening in the capsule to a small uh, capsular excess so that you have a possibility to uh, uh, decrease the intralenticular pressure in this case. You can see that nothing is leaking out. If things are not leaking out, that means the cortex is well hydrated and this will remain pressurized uh, during the entire uh, surgery. So what I am doing is doing a small uh, circular excess here. And subsequently, I'll complete this exercise and aspirate the cortex with bimineral aspiration. Once you aspirate, the pressure goes down and subsequent enlargement or excess can be done. Because this is a small excess, you cannot do a, a FACO uh, very comprehensively in such a small uh, opening. And it's desirable that you make a slightly larger opening which gives you a nice access to the nucleus. And you can manage the nucleus very nicely subsequently. The idea in all these cases is to decrease the interlenticular pressure and do a subsequent fake in these cases. This is a morganine cataract. You can see uh, entire uh, uh, cortex is fluid. The only option here is to asp uh, automatically the fluid will get released and make sure you do a subsequent uh, rexis in a clear visibility by injecting viscoelastic and uh, the pressure goes on in such cases. You can see the entire pressure and uh, we will fill the uh, anterior part and the capsule will go down towards the nucleus. So you have a flat capsule and you can do a subsequent rexis in these cases. The FACO in such cases are relatively uh, uh, difficult because it will be a floating type of uh, nucleus. And uh, you can see a nucleus moving inside and uh, sometimes very difficult to chop. The idea here is to engage the uh, nucleus in the center, hold it, then try to chop from the periphery. In fact, sometimes you can go right up to the periphery of the nucleus as then chop it uh, in these cases. So these are difficult situations because nucleus also gets harder you know all these morganine type of cataract because they are with the cataract for a long long time nucleus gets really hard in such cases so you have to be a little careful doing FACO in such cases especially preventing preventing the posterior capsular damage in uh, subsequently when you are actually eating the pieces out because uh, the pieces has no uh, epicortical cushion support for posterior capsule in these cases the idea here is to break all the uh, posterior attachment of this nucleus and subsequently you can uh, eat out piece by piece uh, in these cases. The idea in some cases difficult situations of beginner at this stage I would say stop surgery, uh, inject viscoelastic, dispersing from uh, your left hand so the posterior capsule remains behind and you can emulsify the last piece in such cases. So this is one difficult situation which sometimes pays in Indian scenario we do have uh, such cases. So this is what I was talking, you can do anterior segment OCT and see what type of uh, cataract you are facing. This is a totally fluid cataract. So as soon as you make a puncture, the liquid will leak out and pressure goes down, you can have a very easy surgery in such cases. This is another patient where you have entire uh, area as pockets. So this fluid is not going to come out with the anterior puncture, the pressure remains throughout your surgery. So this is a difficult case scenario for manual surgeries. So these uh, cases do very well with the femtosecond application. You can see this is one of our patient uh, white cataract in We are doing a femtosecond laser uh, capsulotomy here. The amount of pressurized bag you can see here, the entire fluid comes with the gus. And this makes uh, femtosecond uh, application sometimes a little difficult because you still have uh, additions left here. So when you take the patient for a, uh, under the microscope, you make sure you, t you realize which area would have a, a little bit of attachment or a, that can be treated like a, a doing a re manual rexis. And this gentle movement will have a complete uh, cathlotomy in difficult uh, wild cataract also. So these are small, small things which are important for these cases. If you take a consideration of uh, raised pressure and how to decrease the pressure when you're doing a cathlotomy or cathlorexis, the results of a white cataract surgery also is quite good in those cases. 
Thank you for your kind listening, and um, we would like to invite Dr. Amar for his presentation subsequently. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jeevan, have you tried uh, FACO punch? Uh, <laughs> that is, I think, uh, a concept from Dr. Mohan Rajan. I have not tried personally because I don't want to do certain things which are not under uh, control of a surgeon. Mm -hmm. Like a FACO pu punch may create a, a local opening there and you can take out the pressure also. But capsule can have a ragged opening and if the pressure is high, it can immediately tear in the multiple sides. So that is, I am worried, I have not tried personally myself, I have not tried uh, needle puncture and aspiration also. And YAG laser uh, opening preoperatively for neonates who are trying to do intumescent because that will uh, decrease the intralenticular pressure? Have Anything which can decrease the pressure can be tried, you know. I personally have not tried these uh, techniques because… I know in your hands, but yeah. uh, for some of them who are in the… Uh, because I think the best would be, you know, to do a, a something closed chamber, as you are trying to say, yeah, capsulotomy, which maintains the capsular pressure, may not go, uh, go to periphery. But that can be tried if they want to try the needle also. They can go the needle and puncture and let the fluid leak out. That can also have a similar uh, yeah. uh, pressure releasing of the you know, raised lenticular pressure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now we move. Those who cannot afford the femto laser. The Zepto is a one of the best options for that. Yes. Right. Yeah, Zepto can be tried. Yeah. As I said, you can try any method which gives you, you know, safeguarding your yeah. pressurized uh, situation. Zepto also is, you know, uh, a situation where uh, you have uh, some sort of a comfort yeah. in terms of getting a good, uh, you know, cathlotomy with this device also. But it goes with the price and uh, people say it is a very, very good uh, device compared yeah, to the you know, it other is, types of… It is of disposable only showed, costing 10,000 only. Yeah, somebody showed that it can resist the pressure beyond the manual access also. Sir, thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Amar, sir, for uh, triumvirate rate uh, technique. <coughs> First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Jeevan and Rohit for inviting me for this lovely course of theirs. So let's see basically what we're going to show you here. Now when a patient comes to you with this and you can see there's a small drop there. Now in such cases when it is dropped down and you know there's no capsule present, I always make my markers. So now I made my markers and I'm making my scleral flaps and you can see the simple way to make the markers and the scleral flap is make three cuts, go from one end to the other and just extend it. So I see I've gone from one to the other. It will not take you more than 20 seconds to make each flap. Remember, always have fluid in the eye. So here I'm using fluid in the eye. You can use retina trocars. I prefer to use nowadays the trocar AC maintainers. Now, I'm checking if the fluid is okay on track or not. Now my next step is, since it is partly in the vitreous, anterior vitreous, it has sunk there too. I'm just doing some vitrectomy. And bringing the nucleus up a little bit. Now you can do the modified PAL in which through the sclerotomy you will see me bringing that nucleus up. But once this is done, you can see I have made my two sclerotomies and my IO nucleus is now lying above the iris. So the first portion is I have done a modified PAL or any technique to bring it up. The second part of the time rate is I am now going to inject an IOL. Remember a three piece IOL. Now when I am injecting it, I am injecting it such that it is lying above the iris but behind the nucleus. Both haptics can go above the iris. One haptic can go above the iris, one can be outside. Call is yours, whichever way you want. But bottom line, what have I done? I have created my own posterior capsule. Once I have got my own posterior capsule present, now I can go above that and I can emulsify that fragment. And remember at this stage, my air pump is on. So I've got gas post infusion. I get a deep anterior chamber and you can see my posterior capsule, which is the IOL scaffold is on track. Before you can say bingo, that nucleus is gone. Now, once I have done that, at this stage, I don't see cortex. If there was cortex present or something present, I will use iris hooks to dilate. In this case, I don't see it. So all I need to do is go to the third part of the triumvirate. 
and that is I am going to shift this IOL which is above the iris to below the iris. So here you can see now I am going to do the handshake technique catching the haptic from one hand to the other. The game is very simple. I need to catch the tip of the haptic. One haptic is externalized. Catch the second haptic. Again notice one hand to the other handshake technique till you see the tip of the haptic caught. Once the tip is caught externalized. So I have transferred the PCIO which was above the iris to behind the iris and you see the amount of haptic externalized in both sides is quite a lot. All I do is now create with a 26 gauge needle the Gabor Chariot's pocket and that is game set and match. So you can see the case completed by this simple technique. So we have primary technique which has been published and I have to give credit to Dr. Priya Narang also to help me in that publication with the JCRS journal and this work on it. So we have modified palm, we have the scaffold and the glued IOL all showing up in this particular case. So now let's move to another clipping which I thought I'll just show you in a second and let's take this difficulty slightly more. Now in this particular case, what I thought we will show you here is slightly more complicated situation but the principles are basically still the same. You have a PC rupture and you can see you have brought the fragment anteriorly above the iris. Now notice this, the trocar cannula is above the iris. This is a trocar AC maintainer. So I am not worried whether it is going to the subretinal space, subcorridor space, any space. I have done some vitrectomy. Here you can see I am making my two scleral flaps and once I made my scleral flaps and the same way I am doing the scleral flaps, now my game plan is going to be very simple. I have to do a scaffold. So I am doing the 22 gauge sclerotomy 1 millimeter behind the limbus. Please do not go far back. If you go too far back, the amount of haptic externalization is less. But one problem, notice the slight bleed. When I came anteriorly, I hit the iris. I should have done a small iridectomy, I should have done. I will be talking more on this in my FACO nightmare course which starts at 2.30 in Hall A. But here you can see I am implanting that IUL there. Little bit of bleed is still there but still that is okay. Put the IUL above the iris. Now I go in and I am removing that nucleus with the same IUL scaffold technique. So once I remove, now notice very carefully on your left. Notice carefully, there is an iridectomy there, which is a large one, which has been created there. And some fragment is slightly behind the IUL, so I am bringing it above the IUL. Once again, I am removing it with the FACO emulsification probe. So this makes life very easy for me because I don't have the fear of some big nucleus piece going down. Now once my nucleus is out and you can see there is a small piece left there, I am now seeing my iridodialysis much clearly which I had created by mistake with my 22 gauge sclerotomy. And now notice, I am now going to think of what do I do next and here you can see a small piece lying in the sub incisional area there. So I am just removing that. Now once I have done that, I am doing some more vitrectomy but remember, I have to transfer this haptic. So look, again handshake technique from one hand to the other, catch, bring it out. One haptic is out. Now I have to do the second one. So I am going to do the second one here. See from one hand to the other. You need two glued aisle forceps. They are available with Epsilon. Many companies. Call is yours. And when you pull, I pulled out too much. So again this previous one has gone in. So I am again just again re-externalizing it. But till now pretty okay. Now remember. I am creating my tunnel, tucking my haptics in, but remember case not over because I still have my aerodialysis. So how do you fix this? There are various ways to fix an aerodialysis, but a simple way is you can use the sewing machine technique. In this case, you can also alternatively simple take a double armed straight proline needles. So here you can see I am passing the first arm through that aerodialysis area. Then I will pass the second one and you can see I am passing my second one there and remember they are both going under the scleral flap. 
So when it's under the scleral flap, I know I have no problem. Anyway, that will be glued. But remember, when you do an iododialysis, you will distort the pupil a little bit. I always go back and check in such complicated cases if anybody has dropped a nucleus fragment inside. Now remember, I have to still make that pupil smaller. So I do the single pass, fourth row pupil plasty. So to make the long story short, you can see here now the other side also being done. And once both sides are done, let's see how this patient looks at the end. I am now going to show you after doing the single pass photopiplasty, I apply the glue, seal everything down. Uh, remember, once everything is down, the question comes now, how did this patient look? And you can see how the patient is looking at the end with the pupiloplasty also completed, post-operative day three. This is the patient, the slight escape. Post-operative three weeks, patient is already improved to six, nine. And you can see here, two months post-op, look at the aerodialysis, totally cleared. There is nice single pass photopupilasty and two months post-op vision is 66. Remember, you can dilate these pupils after single pass photopupilasty three times to what you have done with this. It cannot be done with circlage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Amar. Uh, wonderful uh, videos. You make uh, simple things look difficult and uh, difficult things look simple. <laughs> the really wonderful uh, surgical technique. Uh, invite Kamal who will also make uh, things lively for us. Very good afternoon. I am here to talk about cutting edge technology in hard cataracts. So I will refrain from moving on to techniques, styles, burrows, chops. I will be talking about the technology which is coming down. Can I have the presentation please? Yeah. Uh, high end machines, cavitronics, pulses, eyes, all that stuff, expensive. And I myself am a die-hard Venturi user. I have most of the machines in my armory, in my centers. I found this lovely small machine and I started using it. And over time, I started liking what it does for me. So I'm going to tell you what technology can do for us. Now, technology has become cheaper. It's become compact. You don't need big, expensive machines. So I am, a people who know me, I tinker with technology. I play with software. So I tried a lot of things with this new technology. The space is amazing, huge space for us to work. Uh, cutting edge technology in hard cataract. First advantage, no, cat, no cassettes. IA tubings are reusable. A country like India, uh, the company may say 10, 3 in 10 reuses. I've been using them for 5, 5, 6, 6 months, no issues. I'm, I see a few nodding heads in the audience. I think they, are, they are probably agree with me. Precise, pristine vacuum control. I always used to believe that, you know, the best vacuum which I can get is on a Venturi machine. I have nine, I have more than nine Venturi machines in my center. And uh, I was always refraining from moving on to peristaltic bandwagon. But of late, I've started using uh, peristaltic machines. The pinch wheels are more in number. So more pinch wheels give you a faster response time, a better rise time, and a good control on the compliance of the tubing. A cassette transducer sensor systems I will not get into it so what you can actually do is get a very very fast rise time with fast moving pinch wheels and a good compliance tubing uh, the, the companies may tell us uh, back here in India that you, the tubing loses its compliance with autoclaves but these tubings they don't uh, I can see few company people standing here they might not like me for saying that but you can reuse these tubes for a far more number of times than they, they officially say that you can uh, efficiency of uh, lens emulsification. You see, there are two places where you need the fluidics of a machine. One is when you're dealing with a very, very soft cataract. You need a good compliance. Cutting doesn't matter. Number two is you're dealing with a subluxated cataract. You're dealing with a nucleus which is about to sink. You're dealing with a nucleus which has got a phacodonosis. These are the places where you need a good fluidics. And when you need good dynamics of the cutting, you need cataracts which are hard. So here is one machine, comes in a small package. I, I called it the new kid on the block. You have burst mode, you can play around with the pulse modes. I'll just show you some videos which will make you understand. You can actually play on with the pulse on time. I, I, at times when I finish my operation theater, I tinker with this, I set new settings, next day I try it with that. And over time, I've actually got my surgical speed as fast or probably faster than I do on my Venturi top end machine. 
so that's big advantage because it gives you so much of playing space within the software it's a very very easy user software you can actually set the pulses you want the on time the off time the pulse rise time the linearity of the pulse if you understand FECO, if you understand technology, I think this is a machine where you can actually let your horses go wild. APS Pulse Mo Plus mode is something we will share. What it does is, suppose you have an occlusion and the occlusion suddenly breaks. The pinch wheel stops, the flow stops, the vacuum stops, the FECO stops. And you can decide how long it stops. You want it to stop for 0 0.02 seconds, 0 0.08 seconds. Depending on your proficiency or your caliber of surgery, you want to be a very fast surgeon, you can take it down to 0 0.011 second. So you, it always gives you a breathing time. So if I'm setting the machine for my beginner surgeons, I can play with the APS plus mode. We'll see what it does. It's not working. Yeah. Okay, now uh, let's see here what it does for us is, what we can do with this machine is that whenever the FACO tip is occluded, we all know in a peristaltic machine, occlusion is the prerequisite for you to develop vacuum. So when you develop a vacuum, and suppose you're working on a high vacuum, you're working in a very hard cataract, you have a very high FACO coming into the eye, you have very high vacuum, and the occlusion breaks. What this thing does for us is, this is what it does. You go on small pulses, the moment you start getting an occlusion, the pulse will start going up. This denotes the pinch wheel. This actually denotes the, the pinch wheel which is working. The moment occlusion breaks, everything stops. How long it stops, you can decide. If you want to take your time and build vacuum again, build the rise time again, you can slow it down. So as the piece is being taken in, the pulses also change. The pulses change and keep rotating the nucleus so that you don't burrow through. So it keeps rotating the nucleus for you to emulsify and the pinch wheel keeps stopping. I think I'll go to the next slide. My mouse is not working. Yeah. The next is the VIS mode, the variable interval and stroke mode. Now this is very interesting again. Can you play this for me? My mouse is not working. It's not working. There's no light here. Did they get it? No, it's not working. It's not working. Play, play, please. You play from there. My mouse is not working. Yeah, okay. Now, this is the recording of. Uh, it's not playing. I just got my hands on a video overlay. Please excuse the quality of the video because this video overlay records in a VGA which is 470 by 720 pixels and the frame rate is less than 25 so it's not going to be very clear. But what I want to show the audience, I can't even fast forward from here. You can, you can. No, it's not working. My mouse is not working. Okay, anyway, what I can tell you is I can actually demonstrate it on the graph how your vacuum is building up, how the pulses change, how the FECO power automatically goes up. Play it. Why is not my mouse not working? No, it's not working. It's not working. Foreign hand at work. Bari Shaktiya. Anyway, I guess then I'll skip the video. Just skip the video then. Okay, uh, burst mode as we all know, what you can actually do is you can change the very, very, the, the pulses coming on on the burst mode along with the power. I just want to show you one more and at the end of the surgery, every surgery you can take, connect this and uh, take the uh, final outcomes, different types of tips available. I wanted to show you a super hard black brown cataract, how easily this machine does it but again the video is not coming on. Okay. Just play it. Just play it. Just play it. Okay. Now this is a grade four, five, six, whatever you can call it. It's a Morganian cataract. Uh, I'm not using very high FACO. Just see the ease of burrow. Normally, when you do a very hard cataract, it's a good idea to have the tip exposed by more than 0.75 millimeter. It's a leathery hard cataract. It's not just a some normal cataract. It, it's a, you can see the base of the the nucleus is hard. 
the holding of the machine is phenomenal i prefer using a flare tip i prefer using a flare tip even in my soft cases i end up doing my chop also you can see the stretching of the fibers i think this is this is an ideal cataract to actually show the 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 prowess of a machine in handling hard cases there you are and now you see how easily what i want you to see is uh, the the holding and see what happens the moment i lose the occlusion the machine stops for a fraction of a second builds up changes the pulse accordingly whatever i planned in the system so you can get small pulses small pulses as the occlusion keeps building up the machine senses you have an occlusion it throws higher pulses the moment occlusion starts losing it starts lowering down again so everything is automated so you see the ease with which it's working it's actually looking as if this is slow motion but this is not slow motion the machine is actually sensing the occlusion so even in a beginner surgeon's hand what i found was these things were available in expensive machines earlier you didn't have a, a, the, the a middle mid level or the low level machines offering these this kind of uh, modulations of pulses and power of the fluidics now again you see it looks as if it's going slow but the machine is just calibrating the the vacuum the, this is an ideal case for you to appreciate all that see the moment occlusion is gone it's even stopped sucking the air bubbles which means there was no vacuum there was no flow for that fraction of second the bubbles were not taken in normally in another machine you had the bubbles coming in suddenly which tells you there's a lot of turbulence in the interior chamber this was one of my initial cases hard cataracts with the machine and i was trying to go slow but then over time i built confidence i realized what modulations i have to do with the machine and the machine now works like a dream so i guess i guess with this i'll just close my talk the best part is to see the last piece as it goes in normally last piece the surgeon's heart is somewhere near above the cricoid cartilage somewhere here you know but it's not the same here and you have i'm working uh, i'm working with 350 vacuum flow rate of 40 i'm actually going under and holding the piece now because i built confidence in the machine by now and see it's rotating the piece the power modulations are rotating the piece there see that there you go thank you wonderful wonderful uh, kamal uh, demonstration of a machine uh, doing so many comfortable uh, steps for a surgeon to think of my Maybe question is why didn't it strike anybody this the moment the uh, occlusion stop finishes the vacuum you know it just it drops is, yeah it's, it's when the machine came to me the setting was at 0.5 seconds yeah. and i was telling the engineer ye kya hai yaar machine band ho jati hai occlude the, the, the tubing is got occluded till i figured out that i need to set it to the way i want yeah. so i reduce the off time right. and then the machine just takes fraction of second and starts again thank no, you it's a, it's a wonderful concept uh, what uh, rohit is saying you know why didn't it occur to other people to have this type of you know software where things can be so comfortable they are looking for uh, you know so many anti surge uh, yeah. devices yeah. Which, the pump just stops which, yeah, which didn't work at I, all i had made a video also yeah. uh, with two videos running parallel the pump just goes stops and slowly tinkers up and then picks up again thank you kamal thank you. Uh, we would like to thank uh, all the speakers uh, of uh, my two uh, instruction courses and uh, thank you uh, my coach here person dr bharti was here uh, some time before dr rohit omprakash for handling the entire you know one and a half hours thank you again uh, we had a wonderful session thank you uh, audience being with us thank you